First, I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give a talk here. So, uh, I'm Kostu Mana. I work in Max Planck Institute Dresden with uh, Professor Claudia Fenser. So, um, uh, so I, today I'll talk about our recent, uh, uh, recent experimental results on the new fermion stuff. But uh, I'd like to first thank to Niels for giving a nice introduction on this work, and uh, I'll just give a little bit extra overview, whatever we did. <laughs> but I'll try to wrap up a little early because I, at the end I want to talk a little bit uh, about a different topic. So it's on wild, uh, magnetic wild semi metal. So today I'm very excited. We have three papers in science came out online. So I just want to give a brief introduction and if you are interested, we can discuss later in detail anyway. So, <coughs> so uh, this is just uh, in, uh, uh, we started working on this, uh, uh, so this uh, topological chiral crystals in 2017 when these two papers appeared uh, in PRL. And uh, so this uh, overview, like uh, in the gamma and the R point, you should have the new fermion like fourfold and sixfold band crossing. So in the high symmetric points. <coughs> now once these predictions came out, then I have grown a series of single crystal on this uh, all below <coughs> the same uh, symmetric uh, B20 uh, chiral crystals. And uh, of course, depending on the phase diagram, I had to tune my crystal growth technique and uh, uh, then uh, with uh, some flash to self flash to bridge band to chemical hyper transport to open these crystals. And, uh, uh, but I just want to tell you one thing that uh, the same crystal, it can be grown in different techniques. For example, this chromium, for this cobalt silicon, it can be grown in CVT or flux or bridge band, even optical floating zone. But uh, even though it's a single crystal, all case, the quality of the crystal is very, very different. So uh, you need to tune the crystal growth technique to get the best crystal for your experimental results. And out of all these crystals, so this particular sample which uh, we are discussing with about the Nenil stocks, this is not actually single crystal. So this has big grains like uh, 300 to 400 micron grains. So it has uh, like uh, two things, uh, advantage as well as disadvantage. Disadvantage is that it's not a single crystal, but it doesn't make any problem for the RPS experiment as you saw in Nenil stock. But the advantage here is that here we have the grain boundary between the different chiral <coughs> crystals. So right now we are investigating some fancy HTM experiment to see the at the grain boundary what is going on in different chiral crystals. So, but this is an ongoing project. So next I just wanted to talk about these two opposite chiral crystals uh, in this talk. So these uh, different crystals, so I have grown using the seed. So this seed is cobalt 2, as uh, this cobalt doped iron silicon. So it's already shown in literature that uh, if up until 10% uh, cobalt doping, this is a left-handed chiral crystal. Whereas if you increase the cobalt doping, uh, say 25%, then it forms a right-handed <coughs> uh, chiral crystal. So first, these signal crystals are grown, then these are used as a seed to do this forced crystal growth for opposite uh, chiral crystals. So as you see, uh, so we, uh, after growing the crystals, so it looks somehow the bad, but it's not bad quality crystal because we clearly see the RPs and we see quantum oscillation, very nice quantum oscillation in these crystals. So indeed these crystals are very good quality. And we use the X-ray absorption spectroscopy to determine the uh, structural clarity of the sample. And this, uh, this uh, so from this Oikov position, just totally you can understand that the Oikov position are of the PD and G are simply opposite. So these are two opposite current crystals. So we have done different characterization of these samples. So of course, RPS for all these crystals. And uh, as uh, Niels has discussed about the RPS result of this particular platinum gallium and the palladium gallium case. So I'll not uh, go into the result discussion for this section. So I'll just discuss mainly focus on these two part. So like strong, what is the effect of strong spin orbit coupling on the uh, band structure of this on the these new formulas? And second is the CPG results on rhodium silicon. So just give a overview, uh, whatever Niels was discussing the new fermions in aluminum platinum, similar thing we have observed in cobalt silicon also, we have observed these new fermions and this is the surface state. Uh, so there are these helical uh, Fermi arc wrapping around this uh, high symmetric momentum. And this is uh, for rhodium silicon case, the same results as you see, there are these, uh, this Fermi arc wrapping around this uh, high symmetric momentum. And this is uh, experimental result. So this is done in collaboration with Professor Jaid Hassan. And, uh, now point is that all this uh, cobalt silicon and rhodium silicon, we could not resolve the Fermi arc because of the weak uh, spin orbit coupling. But uh, since the churn number is four, of course we should have four number of Fermi arcs in the system. 
So for that, uh, what we wanted to indicate <coughs> is that maybe if we in, uh, enhance the spin orbit coupling in the sample, maybe it will be uh, coming in the health. So for that, we, we focus on this particular compound, which is this platinum gallium. So this compound has the strongest spin orbit coupling in this entire series of these parallel crystals. So this is the band structure of the platinum gallium. And you see this, uh, the effect of spin orbit coupling here. So this is without SOC, and this is after incorporating SOC, what happens? So all the bands, it's, it's strongly split. So this is the color code which shows how the bands split. So they, this blue line, it splits into blue and green, and it holds to for the all other bands as well. Now this is on the bulk band structure, but if you want to see on the surface state, so this is the Fermi arc of this uh, crystal. As you see, there is giant spin splitting of the Fermi arc. So this is like largest uh, splitting of what we can imagine of in this entire series of crystal. So we thought that if we uh, do the experiment, maybe this much more easily we can uh, realize this splitting of the Fermi arc in these new fermion systems. So for that, of course, we need to do RPS, but uh, that is one technique. Another technique is that uh, we can realize this spin splitting of the Fermi, uh, this, uh, this uh, Fermi surface by in the, in the lab itself. So that's by quantum oscillation. So we do the quantum oscillation uh, investigation to investigate the, this band splitting of this uh, sample. So for that, first criteria is to uh, grow very good quality sample. So I have grown, I have tuned the, uh, the crystal growth. And uh, finally, I have the crystal with a very high RRR value. So if you see in literature, the chiral crystals, uh, the reported crystals uh, have RRR not more than 20 or 30. But in this case, we could achieve RRR up to 40, <coughs> sorry, 84, which is very high. And we can uh, observe a very high annular, sorry, this uh, MR until 1,000 uh, <coughs> in this uh, uh, compound. Now this is a quantum oscillation, so we clearly see quantum oscillation until uh, say 7 Tesla and uh, of course it's, uh, and if we zoom in, you will see that the quantum oscillation starts with 0.5 Tesla itself. So it's very high quality single crystal and we observe the quantum oscillation up to 15K and this is a different ang different directions when you apply magnetic field, you see that the nature of the quantum oscillation is quite different. So it's a highly anisotropic Fermi surface. Now to understand the effect of the band splitting, so what we need to look is that the FFT of this, and we check, uh, we uh, compare the uh, frequencies of uh, from the FFT. So this is the FFT of uh, a two Kelvin of a particular magnetic field along uh, one zero zero one direction. So of course there are a lot of frequencies because if you see the from the band structure, there are a lot of Fermi pockets coming because of the different band splitting of the spong SOC, and this is the overall uh, like uh, the total uh, Fermi surface in the. Uh, full religion. So it's a very complicated scenario as you understand. So just for simplicity, we focus at gamma point, what is going on at the gamma point. So at gamma point, uh, from these two bands, these two spin split band, it gives rise to near spherical Fermi pockets. So these two, uh, this red and the blue ones is coming from these two bands. And other two bands give these two kind of this complicated uh, this spin split Fermi pockets. Now, once we compare <coughs> this theory with the uh, experimental result, we, we could very easily identify this alpha 1 and alpha 2 experimentally. Then, uh, for the other two Fermi pockets, when so you want to compare, there are actually three external frequencies. One is at this point, another one is inside, but they are supposed to be on the top also. And this frequency is very, very high. So, as you understand, so as we go away to the higher and higher frequency, the theory and experiment deviates from each other. So that's why we try to focus in the low frequency region and compare theory and experiment. So we could clearly identify these uh, two frequencies, beta 1, beta 2, and gamma 1, gamma 2 in the experiment. And we clearly observe very large spin split of nearly 190 Tesla in this compound. Now next is the RPS experiment. So this is our very preliminary RPS result. So at a particular uh, 67 EV, so this is the uh, RPS uh, the spectrum. Now if you want to compare with the uh, like bulk, what we found is that the theoretical calculation, not only simple bulk, but bulk for surface state combined, it matches very really well with the experimental result. So whatever feature we observe is predominantly coming from the surface state only in this material. Now next is, uh, we want to look into the Fermi arc, what is happening at the Fermi arc, whether we can look at the spin splitting or not. So these are the two Fermi arcs at uh, two different energy, 67 and 23 EV. Mm -hmm. So both cases, you see that this is this, uh, the Fermi arc, which is helically wrapping around these two high symmetric momentum. And at this particular cut, you clearly see there are two Fermi arcs. 
So data quality, of course, is not good. We are right now improving the data, but still it's the clear message that we have the splitting of the farmyard. So this platinum gallium is the second example apart from palladium, gallium, whatever it is was showing. So both of these cases, we clearly see the splitting of the farmyard. So there are four number of farmyards which is coming from the uh, chart number four in this new farmyards. Now next is the practical application, that's the CPG effect. So I'm uh, very thankful to Fernando for giving very nice introduction uh, for this uh, uh, origin of the uh, circular polarized, uh, circularly polarized light like effect in the white semi metal. So, so just to give a conclusive, uh, conclusive <coughs> remark, like once you apply the circularly polarized light in a white semi metal, so the rate of current generation is this much, which is independent from any material specific parameter and it's directly proportional to the churn number of the compound. Now, since in this white fermion, we have churn number four, we should expect four times larger current compared to the conventional white fermion. But if you do this experiment on a conventional Y, you will never uh, observe this effect. That is because we have a mirror symmetry and due to which these two char number, it appears at the same energy. So the current generation from one oil, it will simply nullify the other. So at a rate result, you will never observe the quantized circular photogarmonic response. So at this point, this chiral symmetry of this uh, new formulas, it comes to our aid. So here, instead of the mirror symmetry, we have this uh, glide operation. So mirror plus uh, uh, mirror reflection plus translation. So because of which these two, uh, this uh, opposite char number fermions, it forms at two different energy. So if somehow we can block one Y fermion, then we might observe the circularly polarized uh, response from due to the other uh, Y. But uh, so far, I discussed a lot of uh, chiral crystals. So which of the crystal is the most suitable one for this experiment? So for that, if you just look in the band structure, for palladium gallium or platinum gallium, and these two particular case, it's very bad for this experiment. That's because, you see, there are a lot of other bands which is crossing uh, the Fermi level. So even though you have this CPG effect, it will simply get masked. So there is no point of uh, trying for these two samples. <coughs> so these two crystals, <coughs> silicon, medium, silicon are the best candidate. But cobalt silicon case problem is that this uh, this uh, poorly blocking energy is very small. It's merely 0.3 or 0.4 eV. So uh, the rhodium silicon is the best candidate because here poly blocking is merely 0.7 eV. So it is much better uh, for this experiment. So this is our first experimental result, which is there in the archive. So uh, it is a uh, lot many times it's shown in this uh, workshop. So uh, as you see, there are two important features is that. Uh, so over 0.6 eV, uh, there is a break, kind of a breakdown of this current generation, and below of this 0.6 eV, it's nearly uh, contagious. But uh, as Fernando was telling, this is not actually contagious effect. That's because there are two uh, major problems here. One is that if you see, the net uh, char number is not four, which we should expect. That's one thing. Second thing is that. This lot of noise is coming because the tau, the momentum relaxation time for this sample is very, very small. Okay, so that uh, is uh, that maybe there may be different origin, maybe intrinsic or maybe extrinsic. Extrinsic means uh, maybe there is a defect uh, uh, which is playing role here. So for that, uh, we are improving the sample quality. If we can uh, increase tau, and we can have better experiment. But uh, just to understand what is going on, so just. Uh, just look at this uh, band structure. So until 0.66 eV, what happens here is that the moment you circula pull the circularly polarized light, the electrons it excite from the valence band to the conduction band. But uh, until this much energy, this conduction band is already filled. So there is no way that this uh, this valence band can go. So that's why until 0.66 eV, this uh, this wild fermion is poorly blocked. So whatever result we are observing, it's purely from the gamma point. But our recent result, so once we did the experiment, uh, repeat the experiment on a better quality crystal, slightly better, what you observe is that now noise is slightly reduced, but you see, it's not exactly quantized. There is a certain frequency dependence until 0.66 CV, and this breakdown effect is obvious. Because higher this energy is obviously once this guy, uh, once this wild point gets active, it will simply nullify the effect, overall effect. But below 0.66 EV, what happens is that you have the quantization effect coming from the this gamma point, but the gamma <coughs> point is not the only one which is contributing. See, there is a finite dos at M point also. So the moment you put the 
circularly polarized light, you have excitation coming from the gamma point which already increased the current very high and on top of that you have a frequency dependence coming from the end point. So that's why it's not fully quantized but you have a kind of a this hump kind of effect. But overall from digital aspect point of view you can think of like it's kind of a like quantized and this breakdown happens. So this is uh, our latest result but we are of course improving our sample quality to have uh, better insight in this but uh, this is right now we have. So in addition to the low frequency features it went down by roughly four compared to the previous one? Uh, sorry? Uh, so the, the no, 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 no. See, see, that's why here e cubed by a square, so this is already one third. Okay. So if you count back to char number, ah, okay. still it is three point something. Okay. okay. Three point five. It is still there. Okay. So that's why I just saw beta tau and I saw here the, the one third is term is there already. Yeah, because you only do one component. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Why, why three point five? See, if you see here, that's why one third it is there plus <coughs> one point something. So, so you have to multiply this with three to get the char number. So we are still working on this to improve the data. But uh, next, uh, I want to move to the next uh, topic, which is the magnetic wire semi-metal. So we are very excited today. We have these three papers uh, which came out in uh, science. And uh, all of them, we are discussing the first observation of uh, wire fermion, magnetic wire fermion uh, in, uh, 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 in uh, nature. So, so as you know, the wire fermion can form because of two reasons. One is the broken inversion symmetry or broken time reversal symmetry. But uh, time reversal symmetry broken case, uh, if you see, see the inversion symmetry broken, there are a lot of examples from tantalum arsenide to niobium phosphide, where it's already shown that inversion symmetry broken uh, while farmers already uh, reported. But uh, in 2016, these two papers came mainly from the uh, Barnavik's group and uh, Jahid Hassan's group, where they predicted that this time reversal symmetry broken while farmer, maybe we can realize, in cobalt 2 based full Hessler compound. And this paper when it came out in 2016, we were already doing the experiment uh, in 2016. So main our experimental result, whatever I show, is actually done in 2016. It took nearly three years for us to convince the editors of different journals and different referees to put <laughs> the paper in science. So but the, <laughs> life is hard. So, <laughs> so at the end, we have the paper. So, OK. So to start with, this cobalt-2 manganese gallium. So this compound is a full Hessler compound. Uh, so it crystallizes in FM Barthian space group. And this is the atomic arrangement. So in the band structure, you see we have a band crossing very close to the Fermi level. And this band crossing, it leads to a nodal line, which is protected by this particular mirror symmetry. And in this compound, you have these three mirror symmetries, MX, MY, MZ, which is because of this, we have three nodal lines protected by this three mirror symmetry. Now, what is this nodal line that you can visualize from this uh, one, this uh, picture? So let's consider you have a band overlapping, and this yellow region is just the common uh, crossing point where this band overlaps. So this, no, this is this yellow line is the nodal line. So in this uh, compound, we have three nodal lines which are protected by this particular mirror symmetry. Now, this picture, whatever I discuss, is without uh, uh, spin orbit coupling into consideration. Now, if you consider spin orbit coupling into account then spin is no longer good counter number. Then what happens is that the crystal symmetry reduces depending on what is the direction of the spin. So let's consider we apply the magnetic field and polarize all the spin along the Z direction. Then what happens is that these two mirror symmetry, then MX and MY are no longer mirror symmetry of the system. So if the mirror symmetry once breaks out, there is nothing to protect this band crossing. So of course the bands also gaps out. But the MZ is still the mirror symmetry because of which this nodal line which is lying at the MZ is still protected. And the moment this nodal line it opens up, it gives rise a very strong contrast of the Berry curvature. Now this Berry curvature, it has direct connection with the uh, physical properties. For example, we do anomalous Hall connectivity experiment. So anomalous Hall connectivity is simply the integration of Berry curvature for all the states up to Fermi energy. So if you have a strong Berry curvature contrast very close to Fermi level, immediately we should expect very high anomalous Hall connectivity in the sample. So first we want to do experimental verification whether these nodal lines, whatever theory predicts is at all there or not, then I will discuss about the transport properties. So this is, a, I have grown the single crystal using Bridgman technique and uh, from the magnetic characterizations, what I found is that this compound at room temperature, this is a ferromagnet with a very high moment, nearly 4 mV magnetic moment. 
Okay. So in this room temperature ferro magnet, now we are doing the RPC experiment. So this is our theoretical calculation and this is the schematic diagram where I am showing that these two bands are crossing and this red <coughs> line is actually the nodal line. And in the theoretical calculation we have seen that uh, there are, this, is, this compound has a network of nodal line. There are three types of nodal line. So this, uh, this red, blue and the yellow line. And this is a very complicated network. But once, once we measure the Fermi surface, you see it's a very, very complicated Fermi surface. But all the features, whatever Fermi surface shows, it can be exactly reproduced with the DFT calculation. For example, I just show you the features. So this red, blue, and yellow. So these are actually part of this nodal line, which we see in the, uh, the Fermi surface. Okay. Now I look into this, uh, this different <laughs> Fermi cars, so these different cars, and uh, show it here. Uh, the dispersion, you see that there is a protected band crossing for a range of KY values. So this is a distinctly different result compared to the conventional Y or Dirac Farman because for Y or Dirac you should expect crossing point at a particular K value. But here since uh, for a range of K value we observe the crossing point, so whatever feature we are looking at is actually a nodal line. Okay. Now we are looking at this uh, same case KY cut at different binding energy. So the above and so once we optimize the binding energy, say once we hit the nodal line, we have this dot like feature, but above or below, once the nodal line it opens up, like the band crossing it opens up, like upper cut or ground cut, immediately you see this feature is simply opposite. So whatever feature we are observing here, so this clearly tells that for the first time in this room temperature ferromagnet, we are observing the topological state. Now what is the consequence of these topological states on the physical properties? So for that, we want to measure the anomalous Hall conductivity. So this is the experimental setup where I pass the current here and do the longitudinal resistivity measurement. And this is the Hall uh, signal it shows in the vertical, these two spots. Now this is the temperature dependent of uh, Hall resistivity, sorry, the longitudinal resistivity. You see the sample is metallic throughout the temperature range. And this is from the magnetic field dependence of the Hall conductivity. We estimate the anomalous Hall conductivity by extrapolating from the high field data to a zero field value. So this is the anomalous Hall conductivity for this material. And once we compare this with all the other compounds that is reported in literature, you see our compound sits here on the top. So there is only one material, which is this iron. It has larger anomalous Hall. Otherwise, cobalt to manganese gallium has second largest anomalous Hall conductivity in the literature. Now, how anisotropic is this anomalous Hall conductivity? For that, I do the measurement in two different configurations. So, one case I apply the magnetic field along 110, and the case is along 111. But both cases, the anomalous Hall conductivity does not change that much. So, this compound is uh, highly, it's not, anisotropy is not much. But it's not uh, very surprising also because this is, first of all, this is a cubic material. Second, it's a very soft ferromagnet. So, uh, the anisotropy is very, very low in this compound. But when we estimate the anomalous Hall angle, this is just the ratio of anomalous Hall conductivity with respect to the longitudinal conductivity. As you see, it increases with temperature. And we observe the highest anomalous Hall conductivity of nearly 13, sorry, this anomalous Hall angle of nearly 13% at room temperature. And this is the largest anomalous Hall angle, so in any of these magnetic Hausler compounds. Now next, we want to see how much is the extrinsic contribution in the sample and how much is the intrinsic contribution which is coming from the band uh, of the very curvature from this compound. So for that, we plot this uh, rho x square versus uh, the anomalous Hall resistivity and these points, data points are at each temperature, we take the data of uh, the field dependence of Hall resistivity and from the high field measurement, we estimate the anomalous Hall resistivity and we plot it at a different temperature. So from this slope, what we estimate is that the temperature independent intrinsic contribution of anomalous Hall conductivity, which comes from the slope of this plot. So the slope gives the anomalous Hall conductivity is nearly 1000. And uh, from the RPS measurement, we estimate the Fermi, like where is the Fermi energy. And from the theoretical calculation, we just estimate why, how is the, the V curvature contrast. And the integration simply gives this theoretical curve which shows the innate anomalous Hall conductivity in the sample. So our experimental transport data is here and this Fermi surface lies here. As you see, everything is one-to-one -one correspondence. So the intrinsic contribution of anomalous Hall conductivity and the experimentally determined anomalous Hall conductivity is exactly matching with each other. So this is the collaboration that 
the 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 high anomalous hull coming from the in this material is actually a consequence of the topological states very close to Fermi energy in this compound. So next, uh, I want to uh, uh, go to the summary. So there are a lot of future prospect. Uh, what we can do here? So one prospect is that. So I showed you the electrical transport experiment. Then similarly, we can do thermal transport also. So we have done thermal transport of this uh, cobalt two manganese gallium. So this uh, this and this is the result I compare with the different other compounds. And you see, this is a uh, this is in the log scale. And in the thermal transport, we estimate the uh, anomalous notched uh, thermal power. And as you see, at room temperature, so this value, whatever I compare for cobalt to magnesium gallium, is actually the room temperature value. So at room temperature, the anomalous notched thermal power is seven times larger than any of the compounds ever reported in literature. And since the transition temperature is 700 K, and the value is still increasing, maybe you can have a look in this uh, paper where we have reported this year. So we don't know why it will stop, but it's still increasing. So another aspect is that uh, since the anomalous Hulk uh, angle is very high in this compound, so that clearly gives an idea that the, the, the topological protection in this compound is much more robust with respect to temperature fluctuations. So there is a potential application like if we can make a 2D version of this material, cobalt to magnesium gallium, and make a device like this, and so that uh, so that you have to arrange the magnetization perpendicular, it should not have formed any domains. Then, because of this topological protection, you might observe quantum anomalous Hall effect. And since the transition temperature is very high, who knows? Anomalous Hall conductivity may be protected at very high temperature. So we have discussed many of these future aspects in this review article. So. So we are uh, just you can just go through or you can discuss. So now I want to thank to all of my collaborators who helped me for different characterizations. And Denise is here, and uh, I don't know, no, Barnamik is not here. But anyway, <laughs> all other uh, I thank to thanks all of them, and particularly my uh, postdoc supervisor, Claudia Fencer. So thank you. Uh, questions. Um, I, the chiral crystal growth with the seed is super fascinating. Like, do you have any intuition for like why that this? So you mentioned this iron compound, but like why for some density it's left and other it's right? That's some. Uh, yeah, that is breaking. a mystery actually. Yeah. Right now, uh, we are doing a systematic investigation. Like, uh, see, because the thing is that uh, I'm not chemist, so I just made one attempt. And it was successful. I just carried on. <laughs> so now, now when I'm presenting yeah. the data, many people ask me this question. Yeah. So right now, now we are doing a systematic investigation. So whether it's a, it was an accident or it is a really systematic one or not. So now we have grown different batch of uh, these cover systems, and we are doing investigation. But it's already in literature. It's already mm -hmm. there. There is a PRB paper. Mm -hmm. Maybe I can show you. Mm -hmm. So where they show <coughs> that this left-handed chiral crystal is actually below 10 percent, it goes. Why it goes, yeah, I don't know. Maybe there is energy difference. I don't know, but why suddenly energy difference yeah. will come in this same crystal yeah. structure? Yeah, it's okay. no idea. But, but but now you can grow so that you can grow domain. Uh, or, or not domain, or, actually single crystal yeah. of uh, this cobalt doped mm -hmm. iron silicon crystal. Mm -hmm. Then you can use that as a seed mm -hmm. for your growth. Now depending on uh, there are different techniques you can grow the single crystals. One is the self flux technique. So whatever I used is like, so I put the crystal, cut it in a kind of a cone shape. So I don't know whether, uh, so so you know DSC experiment, right? DSC furnace for measuring the melting temperature. Okay. So this crystal is actually grown in DSC furnace. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I use the cone shape because we wanted to grow the crystal in yeah. a cone shape. So we grow the sample in the cone shape. Then we use that in the bottom of the uh, mm -hmm. crucible. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want to grow, a, uh, now the catch is that the sample which you want to grow, the melting temperature has to have very low compared to the seed. Otherwise, seed will mm -hmm. melt. Okay. okay. <laughs> so now, cobalt silicon, rhodium silicon. If you want to grow, it will never work because melting temperature is nearly mm -hmm. 1500 degrees Celsius. Yes. And this iron silicon case, melting temperature is nearly 1300 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. So palladium gallium is uh, much uh, easier because uh, palladium gallium case is uh, melting temperature around 1000 degrees Celsius. Mm -hmm. So just uh, 
melt it and you can grow uh, depending on the temperature mm -hmm. profile or you can use the Jugalski growth so you can use that as a seed and pull it uh, pull the mm -hmm. platinum gallium sorry palladium gallium from the melt that mm -hmm. also you can grow or maybe can, uh, this optical floating zone you can use that in the seed and then you can grow the pressure mm -hmm. as well. so can you ever get regions of the different chiralities uh, so far uh, the crystals which i have grown the entirely it's a single chiral Mm -hmm. It's a miracle. Mm -hmm. Like, <laughs> because the second one you saw, it's a, like, it looks horrible. <laughs> but it's a single chiral because uh, I have taken pieces from different region of the sample and all turns out to be of same chirality. Mm -hmm. So, it's a single chiral, single crystal. Yeah, actually, I have a follow up question. So, then you show that, uh, so in this regard, like a uh, cobosilis, uh, uh, all of the Cobosilla has one chirality, right? Yes. So is it left or right? Ah, that um, I have to check. That I have to check. Then what about rhodium silicide? That's also single chirality. So that is, I think, uh, right-handed. I have to check, but that is, I think, right-handed So until unless you do a forced growth like this, uh, it's like uh, like in the, as my feeling. If the energy is same then depends on like uh, different batch should have different chirality but within one batch of the crystal should have single chirality. no no mm -hmm. i was you have a you have a one slice so the iron cobalt uh sorry iron cobalt sil uh, uh, silicon right iron you have a one slide that shows yeah this yeah. one so you are, you, are, you were you were saying that when okay, when see this entire pressure see this is the seed of iron uh this uh, uh, this uh, iron cobalt silicon. This is actually the seed, and this is the crystal. Yeah, yeah, okay. No, so this entire crystal is single chiral. Yeah. So here, basically, you're saying that below, when X is below uh, eight percent, it's always left, right? It's always left-handed. It's always so you have, left. Yeah. Yes. So you have and to grow two crystals, one with eight percent dope, and another one is uh, yeah. twenty-five. So so which which means that uh, so the cobalt silicon basically X is one, right? Which means all of the cobalt silicide is right-handed. So I was asking you, is, is that the case? I have to check. I have to check. That's a good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, you're going. So then, then, if X is between these two, so maybe you can, in one sample, you can find. Mixed chirality? Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> Quite possible. Quite possible. But I have, I have to check. So we have a couple more questions. I think we do. We can do all three, whatever. Uh, so we'll do Bing Hai, uh, and then and then you, and then Niels, and then I think after that we'll. Work. Yeah. Oh, question about the Alpha's result of the cobalt two material. Cobalt two minus gallium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It showed that, uh, like, if I, 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 in previous talk or summer we talk this chiral material we see, the Fermi arc has some chirality, some preferred direction, right? Uh, sorry, sorry, tell me one thing. Uh, I mean the surface states in general. Uh, if it's a chiral, uh, I, I first see general. For example, this cobalt tin, this thing, you showed the Fermi arc has some preferred direction because it's breaking in very symmetry. I'm asking here in the opposite result for this material, it's break. You claim it's break time reversal. What's the signature of time reversal breaking in this figure? Uh, see signature in the sense uh, that see this material is already ferromagnetic. At room temperature, yeah, I know, but from from the arc, I can recognize ah, there are some. the arc for this particular compound determining <laughs> Fermi arc is very limited, because see the moment you uh, for that you need to apply magnetic field that is not possible here. First of all, second thing is that uh, it forms the domains with the in internal magnetic field itself. Somewhere it will be have the Fermi arc, but for that it's experimentally determined is very so this is like, impossible. Okay, up has average everything. But from the R piece, what we observe is that see this green part which I didn't discuss. So this is the 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 the, the drum head surface state. So if you have a wild line, then you should observe this drum head surface state from that. So we have actually observed drum head surface state because we didn't apply any magnetic field. So we have the protected nodal line. And once you incorporate uh, ideally, once you incorporate SOC, the nodal line should not be protected. But this compound the SOC strength is very, very weak, because of which the gap is very small, beyond the uh, experimental limitation. So we observe the notation. I see the surface state from the experimental result. Uh, Wait, which way? Maybe I can show okay. this. <laughs> I can show it. Yeah. OK, could you show me the, the picture of a single crystals? 
I'm not sure whether I missed that information or not. Yeah, the next slide. So did you have any special reason to use the ion doped cobalt silicon as the seed? Oh, that's what that's, yeah. See, we wanted to grow opposite chiral crystals to see because see, uh, right now understanding of the topological states is that the topological states are protected by the crystal symmetry. So if you tune the crystal symmetry in principle, you should be able to tune the topological states. Mm -hmm. right? So that's why we try to tune the uh, crystal structure itself. So one case is the structure is left-handed, another case is the right-handed crystal. And we wanted to do our case as Neil showed that if you just do a left-handed, right-handed crystal, the topological <coughs> states itself uh, change. So, so how to do the how to control way to tune the the structure currently? For that, yeah. we use the seed. So this seed. So this cobalt doping is already known in literature that until 10% uh, say this uh, cobalt doping, they say, say Fe.9, CO.1, Si is left-handed current. So that's why you just take these crystals and grow this. So it's not like uh, PDGA was the target. So PDGA was selected because the seed melting, so it's the most suitable one to grow the current crystal. See, the, the COSI, RHSI, it is not possible to grow this uh, crystal growth because the seed melting temperature is much lower. So if you use just the cobalt silicon or just the iron silicon, what did you get uh, as a seed? See, cobalt silicon, I don't have left hand right. No, 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 I mean, uh, okay. So if you grow the sample, there is no chirality. No, of course, there is a chirality. But it will be either left-handed or right-handed. You will not have the control. I see, I see. Right. Okay. So we wanted to have same compound but two pieces one is left hand one is right hand so that's why this is that's what i told this is the forced crystal growth with the seed uh Niels. i have a question about the updated uh, cpge figures so you say you don't reach churn number four because you get additional corrections ah see there are that's what i said there is a shedding of uh, endpoint contribution. Right, right, right. <coughs> so, did they, did they, did anyone try to quantify the corrections from the sort of quadratic bands and this endpoint? Mm, that I don't know. Yeah. May, I think this is actually Professor Joyce, Joseph Weinstein is already working on this, I think. So, let's see. <laughs> so, let's thank the speaker again. and.